Hello and welcome to another ICS Impulse video. I'm Wendy Crumley Welsh, the product manager for ICS Impulse. Today we'll be talking about analysis for head impulse testing. So first thing we're going to look at is why and how we do head impulse testing. So why? The head impulse test is a site of lesion specific test that detects disorders of the vestibular ocular reflex and identifies which ear and which semicircular canal is affected in cases of peripheral vestibular loss. How do we do it? Well, we recommend that it's the first step towards diagnosis and subsequently early treatment. Since the head impulse test is quick and won't produce an adverse patient reaction, it's recommended that the test be performed at the beginning of the assessment workflow. Let's quickly talk about the difference between head impulse testing and caloric testing. Head impulse testing, again, is a site lesion specific test. So it's going to tell you whether it's the left lateral canal, the right lateral canal, the left anterior canal, the right anterior canal, etc. Caloric is ear specific. The head impulse test detects abnormalities in all six semicircular canals in cases with peripheral vestibular loss. So it can look at the lateral canals, the anterior canals, and the posterior canals, and each one of those canals independently. The caloric detects cases of peripheral vestibular loss in the lateral semicircular canal. So it can only look at the lateral canals, whereas head impulse can look at all six. Head impulse test tests with stimuli replicating the patient's everyday situation. So it's a physiologic stimulus. It's how we use the vestibular ocular reflex in every day. You walk to the end of the street, you look both ways, you're using your vestibular ocular reflex to make sure there's no traffic, and then you cross. The caloric, however, tests at a low frequency, approximately 0.025 hertz, so not at a frequency that we use in every day. The head impulse test has the ability to test patients even if they have middle ear disorders. On the caloric, if the patient has a middle ear disorder, it may prohibit performing the test. As we know with calorics, when we're trying to look at a unilateral weakness, we need to make sure that both ears anatomically are the same. You can't have one with middle ear effusion and one without, or one with a mastoidectomy and one without. Those two ears need to be similar in order to compare them and to get your unilateral weakness. With head impulse testing, that's not the case. You can do the test no matter what the middle ear disorder is for one ear or both ears. The head impulse test has the ability to test patients who do not tolerate calorics, such as young children, elderly, or patients with severe hearing loss. With calorics, as we know, some patients will not tolerate caloric testing and will not allow the caloric test to be completed. And the head impulse test stimulus does not persist between tests. That means I can do a head impulse and then quickly do another head impulse right afterwards. The caloric stimulus can persist between irrigations, especially if not performed properly. This is why we say you should wait three to five minutes between each caloric and between temperatures. So let's talk about head impulse test results. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a normal result. So what does a patient with normal limit, within normal limits exhibit? Well, first thing is they may have a few saccades, but nothing of significance. And that's the first thing we look at. Are saccades present or absent? The second thing is the gain. And this compares the eye and the head movement. So a gain of greater than 0.8 for lateral is within normal limits, and a gain of 0.7 for LARP and RALP is within normal limits. Now, that's from 0 0.8 or 0 0.7 up to 1.2. Gains greater than 1.2 are not within normal limits. And then spontaneous nystagmus. This may be present or absent, but what we're looking for is, is there a presence of saccades and is the gain abnormal? So what about patients with overt catch-up saccades? Now what is an overt catch-up saccade? An overt saccade is a corrective saccadic eye movement or catch-up saccade after the head impulse stops. So you do the head impulse, the patient should be looking straight ahead at the fixation dot, their eyes go with the head, and then when the head impulse stops, the eyes move back to the fixation dot. That's called an overt catch-up saccade. And it's typically identified with the naked eye. So when you do visual observation head impulse testing, you can typically see these overt catch-up saccades. So again, the first thing we look at is presence or absence of saccade. If the patient has a saccade, that's not normal. Second thing is gain. So if a patient has overt catch-up saccades, typically the gain is less than 0.8 for lateral, so anything less than 0.8 is abnormal, and for LARP and RALP, anything less than 0.7 is abnormal. Now 0.1 to 0.8 for lateral and 0.1 to 0.7 for LARP and RALP 
is typical of a unilateral loss. With a bilateral loss, typically the gain will be less than 0.1 for both the right and the left side. And spontaneous nystagmus may be present or absent. So to understand the over at ketchup saccades, we're going to look at a video here on headandpulse.com. So there's a rightward head movement, and you see the ketchup saccade. There's the saccade. There it is again. There it is again. There it is again. So it's pretty obvious that this person has ketchup saccades. And then they're going to show you in slow motion as well. So head turns. Eye looks back to the fixation dot. One more time. Rightward. Head's turned. And eye looks back. But as you see, even with the regular recording, the regular speed, an overt ketchup saccade is very easy to see with the naked eye. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is covert ketchup saccades. So what is a covert ketchup saccade? A covert corrective saccadic eye movement is a ketchup saccade that happens during the head impulse. So you're doing the head impulse, the eyes move away from the fixation dot, but go back to the fixation dot before that head impulse stops. And these cannot be identified with the naked eye. They're missed by visual observation. The way they were found was based on scleral search coil data. So with these, the gain is the same as with overt. Less than 0.8 for lateral and less than 0.7 for LARP and RALP is abnormal. 0.1 to 0.8 or 0.1 to 0.7 for LARP and RALP is unilateral loss and less than 0.1 is typical of a bilateral loss. Spontaneous may be present or absent. So let's look at this video in, on headimpulse.com that shows us what covert ketchup saccades look like. And what you'll see is you won't be able to see them when the video is performed at the normal speed, but as they slow down the video, you will be able to see those covert ketchup saccades. So really look, can you see the ketchup saccade? It's very hard to see with visual observation. Now they're going to slow down the video. Head moves. Now the rightward. Head moves and there's the ketchup saccade. So now let's look at normal versus overt versus covert. So here at the top, what you see is a normal response, so we don't see any covert saccades. This is a right side head impulse. The orange is the head and the green is the eye. And in the gain graph, the mean gain is 1.02 and standard deviation of 0.02. And it's all within the white region. We look at the next one down is over at ketchup saccades. So what you see here is the head is in the blue and that the ketchup saccades are to the right or away from the head. They're not happening during the head impulse. So we have all these overt ketchup saccades to the right, the head impulse right here with the blue, and then if we look at the gain, the left gain is 0.41 with a standard deviation of 0.08, and all the gain points are within the gray region. Last one, the covert ketchup saccades. We can see all these ketchup saccades occurring during the head movement. This is a rightward head impulse. The head is in orange, eye is in green, ketchup saccades are occurring during the head movement, gain is 0.33, all the gain points are within the abnormal range or the gray region and standard deviation is 0.09. Let's talk about the spontaneous nystagmus. So I told you spontaneous nystagmus could either be present or absent. So what does a patient with spontaneous nystagmus exhibit? Well, spontaneous nystagmus due to acute peripheral vestibular loss beats in the direction of the healthy ear. Head impulses to the affected side have spontaneous nystagmus beats in the same direction as the ketchup saccade. So what does that mean? So let's look here. We do a leftward head impulse. So this is an example of a patient that has a left-sided abnormality. So what we see here is that if we do a head impulse to the left, not only do we have ketchup saccades, but we've got spontaneous nystagmus spikes as well. So when you do a head impulse to the left, the eyes move to the right. And what we said was that spontaneous nystagmus will beat towards a healthy ear. Well, the right side's a healthy ear, so that spontaneous nystagmus is beating to the right, 
but our ketchup saccade is also going to the right. So you move the head to the left, the eyes go with the head, and then the eyes move back to the right to go back to the fixation dot. So when we do a leftward head impulse, what we see is that the spontaneous nystagma spikes and the ketchup saccades are all in the trace together. And as you can see over here with the gain, the left side is in the abnormal range. Now let's look at the healthy side. So spontaneous nystagmus again beats towards a healthy ear, so it should be beating rightward. When we do head impulses to the healthy side, we have spontaneous nystagmus that beats in the opposite direction or downward. So I do a head impulse to the right, the ketchup saccade, if they had one, would be leftward. Now they don't have a right side abnormality, so they don't have any ketchup saccades. But what we do have beating is rightward spontaneous nystagmus. So those are the spikes that are going downward here. And what we see in the gain is that the right gain is within normal limits. So those spontaneous nystagmus is beating rightward. If we would have ketchup saccades, they would be beating leftward or upward. And we don't have any ketchup saccades because the right side is normal. So what should you do if a patient has spontaneous nystagmus? Well, when you're testing the patient, you want to check the spontaneous nystagmus box that you see right here on the left side. This uses a different algorithm for head impulse acceptance. If you don't check it, chances are most of the head impulses will be rejected because the spontaneous nystagmus interferes with the algorithm. So by checking that box, you let the algorithm be more free to accept data. So it's a little more lenient. Now, let's say that you're doing a bunch of head impulses and everything's rejecting and you're wondering why and you thought, oh, I forgot to check that spontaneous nystagmus box. Well, as long as you have raw data saved, then you can come in and go into reanalysis and check the spontaneous nystagmus then and it will reanalyze the data as if you would have checked it at the beginning and you don't have to sit there and recollect all that data. Okay, so there's two ways to do it. At the beginning, which is best, and then if you happen not to check it, you can do it after the fact and reanalyze. Now, where do you turn on that raw data? It's in your options. So head impulse options, there's a checkbox up at the top left corner that says save raw data. You have to have the save raw data on in order to be able to reanalyze the spontaneous nystagmus. So let's talk about the analysis some more. So we said again, the most important thing is presence and absence of saccades. And you're gonna see saccades in either 2D analysis or 3D analysis. And we're gonna show you some data and show you where this presents itself. The next thing is the gain graph, which has normative data. Then we're gonna talk about the new hex plot, which was introduced in the software version 2.0. We're gonna talk about the info tab and then how to compare tests. So how do you compare one test session to another test session? And we do that by looking at the progress graph and progress data. So first thing is the saccades are the most important thing. And so what you see here now in version 2.0 is that the red spikes are the saccades. So this is an example of a unilateral loss. The left side is actually abnormal, abnormal for the lateral, anterior, and posterior canal, but is normal for the right lateral and anterior and posterior canal. So the left side is abnormal, the right side's normal. So red is the spikes, those are your ketchup saccades, and the green is still the eye trace. So the eye trace is shown in green for the vestibular ocular reflex and red for the saccades. So the way we calculate gain is we compare the green trace and on the left side it's to the blue trace. The blue is the head. If you were looking at a right side you would have orange traces. So first thing is presence or absence of saccade. So we can see that there's saccades in all three canals on the left side and not on the right side. In the 3D view here, you can see again, the eye is always green, the head is either blue or orangish color for left and right. And you can see here in the 3D view that you have ketchup saccades for the left side and not for the right side. So the ketchup saccades can be viewed in 2D or 3D view. The gain graph, so you're gonna have three gain graphs, one for lateral, one for LARP, which is left anterior, right posterior, and one for RALP, right anterior, left posterior. If the gain is in the white, it's within normal limits. If it's in the gray, it's, a, it's abnormal. 
and the dark gray is bilateral loss at the bottom. The other thing the gain graph tells you is the mean gain. So at the top here, left lateral mean gain is 0 0.92, and the standard deviation is 0 0.05. The right lateral mean gain is 0.88 with a standard deviation of 0.02. And the other thing we introduced, which we will talk about, is the asymmetry. So in the gain graph, the dots that are on the rightward head impulses are red, leftward head impulses are blue, the big X is your mean, the peak velocity at the bottom is the maximum velocity representing for that particular head impulse. And as I said before on the normative data, white is within normal limits, light gray is unilateral loss, dark gray is bilateral loss. You have the average for all gains for the right and the left in the standard deviation. And just so you know that these cutoffs can be changed in the options window. So if you decide to collect your own normative data and want to change those cutoffs, you can do that. Now, the normative data was based on two things. When we released the first version, 1.0, we based the normative cutoff on publication by Hamish MacDougall and several other people in Sydney, Australia, at the university. Then what we did is we were looking at a lot of our data that was coming from our customers. And so we pulled a lot of data globally and looked at the normative data cutoffs again and Ian Kerthoys reanalyzed everything, and we decided that the cutoff for normal was a little too low. So it was originally 0 0.6. In version 1.2, it was raised to 0 or lowered to 0 0.8. So the cutoff between normal and abnormal is 0 0.8 now, based on a lot more data and more data analysis. Let's talk about the asymmetry. So this is calculated based on the planes tested. So this asymmetry ratio that is given to you in the gain graph looks at the left lateral to the right lateral, looks at the left anterior to the right posterior for LARP, and for RALP it looks at the right anterior to left posterior. And the formula for the asymmetry ratio was based on a publication by David Newman Toker et al. The other way to look at data is in the new hex plot. So in version software version 2.0 we now have the hex plot. So this is a nice, easy way to see. Let's talk about the middle section first. So here you have left anterior, left lateral, left posterior. Then you have right anterior, right lateral, right posterior. If the bars are green, they're within normal limits. If the bars are orange, that's abnormal. If the bar is yellow, that means that the gain is above 1.2. So the bar color is dependent on the mean gain. So, for example, let's take the left lateral here. The mean gain is 0 0.67, and therefore that is in the gray region, and so the bar is orange. Let's look at the right lateral. So the mean gain is 0 0.99. That is within the white region, so the bar is green. That's within normal limits. So the hex plot may, gives you an easy view. Of, you can easily see left side's abnormal, right side's normal. You also have your traces. And then the other thing I want to talk about is the asymmetry ratio. Because it's the same formula, but a little different than the gain graph. So like I said before, the green is within normal limits. The orange is low gain, or the yellow is a high gain. Now, if you again were to collect your own normative data and change those limits, then the color is based on the limit set. So if you were to change the limit to, let's say, 0 0.9, then anything 0 0.9 to 1.2 would be green. So asymmetry. This is calculated based on the set of canals. So remember, in the gain graph, it was based on lateral, LARP, and RALP. In the hex plot, it's anterior to anterior, lateral to lateral, and posterior to posterior. Now, why did we give you two different asymmetry ratios? Well, ENT doctors that we talked to felt that the way we did it in gain graph was appropriate, and neurologists that we talked to felt that the way we did it in hex plot was appropriate. So we decided to implement both to make both parties content. Now, right now, this is more of a research feature because we don't know what the cutoff should be for abnormal or not abnormal for asymmetry. So you need to just take the value and interpret it yourself, how you see fit based on the other information you have on that patient. 
Now the asymmetry ratio is the same formula as it was in the gain graph and the reference article is the same. So looking at test info, you have several numbers here. You have analysis numbers and collection numbers. Let's first talk about, about collection. So collection is the head impulses that are accepted or rejected during the head impulse test, so while you're physically moving the patient's head. And what we see here is we have 20 accepted on the left, 21 on the right, and one reject. Now all of the raw data, not just what is accepted in collection, but all the raw data goes through a second algorithm, which is the analysis algorithm. And now if we look at those numbers, you have 20 on the left, 20 on the right, and two rejects. So one of those right ones, it decided, you know what, that wasn't the best head impulse. So it went ahead and rejected it. If you're doing your head impulse properly, these numbers should add up. So we have 42 for collection and 42 for analysis. So we know we did our head impulse properly. If you're seeing huge discrepancies between these two sets of numbers, then you need to look at how you're doing your head impulses. Are you doing them too quickly? Are you doing them too large? Remember the sweet spot is 150 to 200 degrees per second. So the other thing to point out here is the frame rate. So the average frame rate for this test was 245, which is good. So you want that frame rate to be above 219. You have the analysis. This is the number of right-left impulses accepted and the number of rejects passed. These are the ones that pass the analysis algorithm. And this is the data that's displayed on the 2D and 3D graphs. The collection is the number of right and left impulses accepted and the number of rejects. And these are the ones that pass during the collection algorithm or while you're actually physically doing your head impulses. So this is the data that's displayed in the collection window. The other thing you had on that screen was the frames per second. This is the average frame rate when the data was collected. And you have this frame rate also on the collection screen as you're collecting. But if the frame rate drops below 219 during data collection, the head impulse will be rejected. The reason why this is is because we're displaying the, the trace in milliseconds. And so for us to make sure that we have a four millisecond window and that the milliseconds are represented appropriately, the frame rate cannot slow down. So any frame rate, any head impulse that's collected with a frame rate below 219 will be rejected. And then we have progress graphs, and then we'll talk about progress data, and I'll show you this in the um, software as well. But the progress graph allows you to look at multiple test sessions. So here we could check, if we wanted to, we could check multiple LARP test sessions and multiple RALP test sessions, and then look at the data. So maybe I want to see, are they moving from overt to covert saccades? Or did they have saccades and now they're resolved? I can look at different test sessions at different times and compare the results. The other way to compare the results is the progress data. So if there are three or more tests available, the three that display initially are the first test, the most recent test, and the test currently displayed in the 2D, 3D window. So what you have here is lateral, LARP and RALP, and then each test session will have a different color. So you can tell the colors by the legend up top. And in this, it will display for you the mean gain for the left, the mean gain for the right, as well as the asymmetry ratio. So let's look at patient data. Okay, so I'm here in the Otosuite vestibular software that's used with the ICS Impulse. And I'm going to search, because I know all my patient data, demo data, has the first name data. So I can easily search in our patient list. So let's look at a normal first. We already have the normal pulled up. So we're going to go to head impulse here. And what we see here is, what do we need to look for first? Are there ketchup saccades or not? So we look here, and we don't see any red spikes. So we know that all the traces are that there's no ketchup saccades present, so they're within normal limits. And if I look at the gains, all the gains are close, are in the white region. So that's all within normal limits. Now let's look at the 3D analysis. So if I wanted to look at these in 3D, and let's just take the lateral and, and make that big, I can then rotate these and look and see at the, the data here. And what I want to see in a normal is that the head and the eye are on top of each other, which they are. And then, the last thing if I want to look at is the hex plot. So again, this was new for version 2.0, but we can see here, if I quickly look at the hex plot, everything's green, everything's within normal limits. Now let's look at some abnormal data. So again, I'll search data, 
and let's start with the overt ketchup saccad. Now, the overt and the covert were collected um, before we had LARP and RALP. But you can see here in version 2.0, I've got these beautiful red spikes that are my overt ketchup saccades. So I'm just gonna, I can use my up and down arrows once I click in that window and I can go through each one of these um, impulses. So if I see here, this is a one impulse, the blue is the head, the green is the VOR, the red is the spike, and over here where the gain point is circled, that's the gain for that one trace. So I can search through all of these independently, but you can easily see that those ketchup saccades happened after the head stopped, and so those are over at ketchup saccades. If we look over here on the right, all these downward spikes are actually spontaneous nystagmus. Okay, but the right side is normal. Now let's go back to our patient list and let's look at somebody who has covert ketchup saccades. So again, first thing we look for, are there any ketchup saccades? And yes, there are. So the right side is actually the abnormal side, but the right side is so abnormal, it actually pulls down the good side, which is the left side, and that's very typical. But as you see here, that first ketchup saccade is occurring during the head movement. And sometimes what you'll see is more than one ketchup saccade as they're trying to get back to that fixation dot. So we have these covert ketchup saccade and then we have a little one, a little overt following it. So we can go through, we can see that there's obviously ketchup saccades occurring during the head movement. So that's an example of covert. And you can look over in the gain graph and see which gain is circled for each one of those points. The other thing to point out is down at the bottom, you will see the gain for that particular head impulse. So this one is 0 0.27 and the peak velocity for that particular head impulse. So this peak velocity was 116 degrees per second. So that's how quickly the head was moved during the head impulse test. Let's go back to our patient list. And you can also see up here that asymmetry was 56% there's a significant difference between the right and the left side. So let's go search data again and let's look at a unilateral loss. So this one we saw before, what we see is the left side's abnormal, the right side is normal, the red is in the white region of the gain graph, the blue is in the gray region of the gain graph, and we've got these beautiful spikes. Let's go in and let's look at this in 3D. So one thing Michael Hamagi says to look for is the canyon, and actually the left anterior is a good example of this. But see this big canyon or difference between like a hole between the head movement, which is the blue, and the eye movement, which is the green. So if you see that canyon, that's where the gain is not working appropriately. The, the eye is obviously different from the head. So again, you can turn all these around and look at them however you want, and if you want to put them right back where they were, you just hit the reset button. And then if we go to hex plot and look, we can see again the left side is abnormal and the right side is normal. Okay, let's go back to our list and let's look at a bilateral loss. So here we go. We have got ketchup saccades in all six canals, right and left lateral, right and left anterior, and right and left posterior and all of the gains are in the gray region. And let's go and look at this in 3D, and we can see that beautiful canyon that Dr. Hamagi talks about in his talks. So you can see them in all of these. Ooh, we went a little too far, there we go. All of these traces. See that there? And move this one around here, there you go. So we've got this beautiful canyon for all six of the canals and obviously this person has ketchup saccades and a very reduced function of their vestibular ocular reflex. And if we go to the hex plot, we can see everything's orange and small. So that's abnormal. Now let's look at some more interesting cases here. Let's look at a superior neuritis. So what should we expect from a superior neuritis? If you remember your anatomy and physiology, the lateral and anterior canal are innervated by the superior vestibular nerve. So what we should see, and this is an example of a left abnormality, is the left lateral and the left anterior have ketchup saccades, which we see here. Left posterior and the whole right side are within normal limits, no ketchup saccades. 
And then if we look at the gain graph, we see that the right side for all three canals is in the normal range, and the left lateral, left anterior are in the gray range, and the left posterior is in the white range. So we have abnormality in the lateral and anterior canal. If we go to the hex plot, again, what does this tell us quickly? We've got left anterior and left lateral abnormality and everything else is normal and in the green. Now let's look at inferior vestibular neuritis. So again, your anatomy, what should we see here? Well, the left side's normal, but the right side has a right posterior abnormality. And again, your posterior canal is innervated by the inferior vestibular nerve. So what we should see here is that there's no ketchup saccades in the left side and that the gain is in the white region. The right side for lateral and anterior, no ketchup saccades, gain in the white region. But what we have here, posterior, we've got these ketchup saccades here, beautiful ketchup saccades, and our right gain is in the gray region. And let's go to hex plot. And what do we see there? Right posterior is orange. That's abnormal. Everything else is green. So, and we can go to the 3D as well and see that we've got that canyon going on. There's a gap there that you can see. And then we've got these ketchup saccades. Let's go back to our patient list and data. And let's look at a Meniere's patient. There has been reported by Dr. Leonardo Manzari and Ian Kerthois in some articles that they have seen this in patients with Meniere's that the gain is high. So it's above 1.2. And we don't know why that occurs yet. And it may be that there's differences between Meniere's patients. Some Meniere's patients exhibit this, some may not. But I want to show you this because it may be something that you see when using the ICS impulse. So first, let's talk about the left side. So this person had had Meniere since they were 10 years old. They had had a vestibular neurectomy on the left side, but she still suffers from Meniere's on the right side. So what we see here in the left side is we get these beautiful covert saccades. So she's compensated. We believe she's compensated for her disorder, um, and that's why she's producing these covert saccades. But you can see the saccades are happening during the head movement. So beautiful covert saccades, but the gain is abnormal. Then when we look at the right side, so this is the one that's interesting. Notice that the eye is bigger than the head. So the green is bigger than the blue when I have the trace highlighted. And you can see this for every single one of the head impulses. And we look at the gain points, and the gain points are above 1.2. In fact, her average is 1.31. Well, that's not normal. A normal person would be between 1.2 and 0 0.8. So this is something that has been reported to be seen uh, with patients who have Meniere's disease, that the eye is bigger than the head. If we go to the hex plot, what you see here is the left lateral is abnormal, it's an orange. The right lateral is yellow because the mean gain was above 1.2. And the other four were not collected. So let's go back to our patient list and we've got one more patient to look at. And this is a vestibular migraine. Now, we don't know a whole lot about head impulse and vestibular migraines, but if you look here, we've got lateral disorder, we've got a right posterior and a left posterior. Well. We know that's not superior neuritis because it would be anterior and lateral, and it's not inferior neuritis because it would be posterior only. So we don't know what we'll find with these vestibular migraine patients, um, but I just want to show you some data. You may see things that are unusual, and this may help you with your diagnosis, but vestibular migraine patients can vary in their results. And if we go to the hex plot, We'll see here we've got the lateral and the posterior canals abnormal and the anterior canals normal. And the last thing is reanalysis. This is new in version 2.0. So there's a couple of things you can do in reanalysis. We've already talked about spontaneous nystagmus. So that's right here at the top of the screen under the reanalysis tab that you could check that if you forgot to check it at the beginning. But the new thing is a ketchup saccade parameter reanalysis. 
So what this does is you have two slider bars, a baseline amplitude and a start position. So the baseline ap amplitude, the setting identifies the saccade based on how steep the slope of the back side of the saccade is. Adjust this slider if you believe an eye movement is misidentified as a saccade or that the eye movement should be identified as a saccade. And then the other option is the start position. So this setting determines where the software starts to look for the presence of a saccade. And again, if you believe that the algorithm didn't function properly, then you can change this. Now, no algorithm is out there is perfect, and sometimes your naked eye is a little bit better than the algorithm. And that's why we implemented this, so that if you believe that the algorithm um, did not perform properly, then you can reanalyze. So I'll show you an example of when this typically occurs and why we implemented this. So first, just to point out how the software works and the reanalysis in the baseline versus the amplitude. So here's an example of what looks like a covert saccade right on the top of the peak of the head movement. So why does this look like a covert saccade? It's a very steep or what Ian Kurthoys would call like a stalactite type of shape. So a very steep pointy shape and that's what we typically see with saccades. It's not a very broad shape um, or kind of rounded off. It's very steep and pointy. So that's what the algorithm looks for is, is there a ketchup saccade there? Now based on the shape of this, one thing that it looks for is that it says, you know what, this looks like a ketchup saccade to me. Now we call it covert because it's right on top of the head. Um, then if you look at the green, so what the algorithm does is the first thing it does is it desaccades before calculating the gain. So it's going to take that saccade out of the picture and then try to calculate the VOR gain and look at the gain between the eye and the head. So it thinks this is a saccade and so therefore it takes it out of the picture, the green is where the VOR is and then it compares the green to the blue and that's why the gain point, which is this little one circled here, is low. Now maybe based on the information I have with that patient, I don't believe, maybe I think this patient has been years and I don't believe that that's really a covert saccade, that was just a normal eye movement for that patient. So then I could go in and reanalyze it. So let me point this out to you real quick. Start position again is where it starts to look for saccades and baseline amplitude is the back end of that saccade, so how steep that is. So first thing I want to talk about is why does this data look this way? So the eye velocity is higher than the head velocity. So therefore we have these really high gains. And we've got these high gains not only on the left side but also on the right side. So the first thing you have to do is rule out goggle slippage. So was the strap not tight? Is there a gap between the face cushion and the skin? Were you using an old face cushion? The reason why these face cushions are disposable is because we want to make sure they fit well and they stay snug to the face and so reusing them over and over and over again can often cause slippage. So were you using an old face cushion? Was the cable clip not attached to the right shoulder? Was the tester touching the goggle or the strap during the head impulse? Because if you touch it, you have the possibility of moving that goggle. Or, last thing is, is the patient have very compliant skin? So is it a really elderly patient where the skin on their face is a little bit on the loose side? So if you think that none of those things occurred, then we need to look at some other things. First thing is, is was that patient closer than a meter to the fixation dot? So we say you need to be a meter away because you don't want convergence of the eye. So you want to make sure that you're positioned appropriately. So if you're too close, you will get convergence and therefore the gain will be higher. The next thing is, is, hmm, was this really a Meniere's patient? Do we think this is similar to the data that's been reported? First thing is, is if you see the eyes leading the head in the real-time trace, stop and check the goggles in the patient's setup. Make sure that you're not doing any of those listed that could cause goggle slippage and that the patient is appropriately seated away from the fixation dot. And then, the la then if you think all of that's done, continue your test, and then you've got to analyze your data as it is, but you've ruled out any kind of user error. So let's go into the software here and let's pull up this data that I'm showing you. So here's the way it comes in to me. 
I can look through these and I can see that obviously sometimes it's identifying this sharp peak above the head as a covert saccade. So if I believe that this is not the case, I can go to reanalysis. We choose the left side and then I believe this is a baseline shift error. It's not where the peak is starting. It's really the sharpness of the back end of the peak is where it's saying, you know what, this is not just a no normal eye movement. This is a catch-up saccade. So what I can do is I can adjust, I'm going to slide it to the right, adjust this slider until all of those peaks turn green. If I go the opposite direction here, if I thought these were all catch-up saccades, then I would adjust to the left and make the peaks turn red. But if I'm saying, you know what, I don't think these are catch-up saccades, then I can adjust these. And then I go back to my gain graph and all of the gains are high. Okay, so it'll automatically fix your, recalculate your gains for you. Now, let's say you decided you did this and you don't, you want to go back to the original. All you have to do is hit restore default, and that goes back to what the algorithm believed is the correct result. So that's the way you reanalyze. It's very simple. You just need to make sure that you choose either right or left, because you can do each one independently, and then use the slider bars leftward or rightward to adjust the colors and then when you go to the gain graph it's recalculated your gain for you. So last thing, you can learn lots about ICS Impulse on icsimpulse.com through all the videos and you can learn a lot about the research behind the ICS Impulse on headimpulse.com. You can also find on headimpulse.com where speakers are speaking globally um, and both websites are a very great resource for you.